to us in Christ. One of the regular prayers of mine, uh, as Ron and I uh, usually pray almost every morning, and as we pray together, one of my constant prayers is asking God to make me more deeply aware of all the resources I have in Christ. Those who believe on Him have been united to Him, and so the faith, the strength, the wisdom that is ours in Christ, that I might draw on it, might live into it, uh, might delight in it. So uh, may we know that so that we can trust Him and walk with Him. Well, I just want to welcome you uh, to EBC. Uh, we're so glad that you're joining in today. Uh, whether you're regular here or whether you're a first-timer that you're sitting in, uh, whether you're by yourself or you're with a group uh, that's sitting to watch together. So we say this often here, we exist as a church to honor God and to love people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. That mission statement, that sense of purpose is going to be important this morning because we're going to be talking about uh, the church and what the purpose of the church is. Over this year, uh, as many of you know, we've been working through a series that's focused on uh, what the Bible teaches about important things or what the main lines of biblical teaching is that should guide our understanding of ourselves and the way we are as the people of God, how we function, what our purpose is. Uh, and those are called doctrines, the teachings of the Scripture uh, that we synthesize from what God has said in the Word of God. And so these things should drive and shape the lives of those who follow Christ. So we need those teachings to understand who God is, who we are, and what we should be up to in the world. And so we've called this series Following the Map because as we uh, look at the teaching of Scripture, it lays out a way of life. It lays out the way we should think about God, the way we should think about ourselves, the way we should think about our neighbors, and how we should live in relationship to each other. So uh, on this map, we've been looking at a number of things. We've worked through a number of the teachings that have to do uh, with the nature of a life and relationship with God. And today, uh, we're going to continue our discussion about the church. Uh, the term that's uh, from uh, the history of the study of doctrine that's referred to the study of the church is called ecclesiology. We mentioned that last week. Ecclesia is the Greek term that's picked up there that's transliterated in ecclesiology. Uh, it simply means the church, and logos, the last part, ology, uh, has to do with a discourse or an account of the church. So last week we started by trying to define the idea of what a church is. And so as we talked about that, we needed to define what a church is uh, before we can talk about what a church does. And as we looked at our last week, we found out a number of things, and if you see on the right of your screen here, we found that the church is, the re is redeemed humanity, those who have come to a belief in Jesus Christ, believe that He is the Lord, that He is God, that His death was for them, that He died in their place to take what was rightfully theirs on Him so that what was rightfully ours could be forgiven us. So He took the punishment that we deserved and He gained for us the life that we could not win. And when we put our trust in Him, and we're united to him by faith, that becomes ours. So we enter into the benefits of his death and the benefits of his resurrection. And so we come under his benevolent rule and care. And so, but the thing that's crucial here, it's redeemed humanity that is uh, in a particular period of God's uh, development of his purposes on the earth. And so that period is the time in between Christ's ascension, his going back to heaven, and his coming return. That period of time is where the church exists, the unique people of God in that period of time. And we could talk about the people of God through the ages, the people who've been rightly related to God by faith, believing on what they knew of Him to be true. But here we're talking about a group of people that are on the earth during this period of time in God's uh, salvation purposes. And what we found out about this group of people is that it's made up of Jews and Gentiles who equally experience the inauguration or down payment or beginning of the new covenant blessings that are promised in the Old Testament that are associated with the Messiah, Jesus, his end-time kingdom. And those were forgiveness and cleansing, the law inscribed on our heart by the work of the Holy Spirit, resurrection life, so that everywhere a knowledge of God is made known to those who believe on him. Now, it's inaugurated, those new covenant blessings, because they won't be fulfilled until what we've called the Zionic era, era, when Christ returns and he establishes his kingdom and the new heavens and new earth. 
but that beginning has happened here, but not in its completion. So it's an inauguration. It's a down payment on what's yet to come. And second, that all of those enter into these blessings when they believe on Christ and are united with Christ and one another by the Spirit. So we looked at Galatians 3 for that. And then thirdly, they express this change by holiness toward God and love toward one another, a love that embraces their equality before God as well as all of their human, ethnic, cultural, and national differences that do not stand contrary to their identity as followers of Christ. So in this new people, even though we all have equal access to God, we all have uh, equal resources from God to live out our life, and that we have no difference in value before God, that doesn't mean that you don't find difference within the body of Christ. There's males and females. There's people of, of different education levels and different ethnicities and different backgrounds. Well, God wants to redeem all of that. He wants to let the multifaceted character of humanity and its richness ride it in a peace with one another to be brought into the family of God. So it's a unity, but it's not a uniformity. It's a oneness in commitment to the Messiah. It's a oneness in sense of participating in the benefits of knowing Jesus, but there's a diversity in terms of the expression uh, of our humanity. And then third, uh, fourthly, the outward signs of participation by faith in Christ as in the new covenant blessings is baptism, right? So Jesus says, wherever you go, you teach what I taught and you baptize the followers of me, those who believe in me, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And if you are participating in the new covenant by belief in me, then you will take communion because the body of Christ is celebrated in the bread of communion and the blood of Christ signifying his forgiving of himself for us. And we celebrate that. It reminds us of this new covenant that Christ inaugurated and allows us to enter into by faith. We also found about this church that we could speak about it as the universal church in the sense that it's made up of everyone, past, present, and future, from every place on the globe who believes in Christ during the time between Christ's ascension and return. So it's universal in that sense, but it's also local in the sense that those who are believers in Christ live out their life with Christ attached to local groups of believers. So you'll read in the New Testament Christ will talk about, I will build my church in Matthew, right? Speaking of the fact that all those during this period of time, from Christ's ascension to Christ's return, that Christ will build that church, that it will not fail, that it will move forward and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But everywhere we read in the New Testament, everyone who is a part of the church, who's rightly related to God by faith in Jesus Christ, is also a member of a church. So the way they live out their relationship as the church, as they live it out in local groups of believers. These are groups all over the world. They regularly gather in Christ's name to officially affirm and oversee one another's membership in Jesus. And they, serve, they gather together under qualified leaders so that they can have gospel preaching and gospel ordinances, the communion and baptism administered. So we've talked about what the church is. Now today, we want to move on and we want to talk about what the purpose of the church is. So what is the church for, right? So what is it the church is supposed to do and be in the world as we await for Christ to return? So what are we supposed to be up to? Now in the West, where we are, in the West in America, uh, in North America, in Europe, uh, in different places, there is a real question today about what the church should be about. And many, many are saying that the church should be an institution dedicated to social justice concerns as its first and central priority. They see that the church should be attending to any injustice that can be found in the cultures where they live. The goal of the church is to identify these injustices and cooperate with anyone else who is a co-belligerent with them, any groups of individuals fighting that injustice, and bring it to an end. In so doing, the church is either bringing in God's rule by their action, and so not only living as kingdom people, but building Christ's kingdom, one social justice victory at a time. Or, you could say, by attending to these social justice issues, they are at least putting their priorities in order. Righting society's ills through social action is the top priority of the church, many would argue. And with righting social injustices as their central priority... This also becomes the standard of their health and effectiveness as followers and representatives of Christ. 
So if you believe that this is the role of the church and you step into Emmanuel Baptist Church or you step into any church, you're going to listen to see, well, what kind of social justice concerns are they after? And if they're not after that, well, they must not be a real church. So this discussion about the purpose of the church really is as old as the church itself. As a matter of fact, we're going to turn to Paul's teaching where he's writing to a church that has lost its purpose. Now, one of the things that we've talked about all the way through, uh, right, the scriptures are our guide as we talk about doctrine. Uh, as we talked about scripture, this is God's word to his people to tell them who he is, to tell them what he's up to, to tell them who they are and how to be in a relationship with him and what it means to live out a life in relationship with him. So Paul turns to this church, and we're going to look at the church in Ephesus, and you want to get ahead of me, you want to turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, and here he's speaking to the church at Ephesus through Timothy. And what he's going to talk about is that this church has been been, uh, taken off of its purposes to its purpose that God gave it through bad leaders. Now I want to uh, say what Paul's going to say here in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now we'll get to chapter 2, but I want you to look at chapter 1 here for a moment and come uh, and we'll read verses 3 through 5. And here he gives Timothy his commission as he arrives in Ephesus. This is what he's supposed to do. And he's supposed to bring the church back online. So he says, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, this is chapter 1 and verse 3, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart, right, and a heart that has a pure, full commitment without any mixture of any other kind of allegiance. There's a pure heart and a good conscience, a conscience that is informed by biblical truth and a sincere faith, an unadulterated, complete commitment to God. So he says, Timothy, I want you to go back and get the household, God's house, back in line with God's household rules. And so What I put here, if you'll see it on the the screen here, is God is the master of his house, is what Paul is going to use this household or family metaphor. So God is the master of his house, his family, and it is God's household rules that should set the direction for his family. So when it says, Timothy, you're, you're there to promote God's work, the term that is used there is the term oikonomia. It's the term where we get our English term economy from, right? a set of rules that order and govern people's activities. So here an oikonomia is literally oikos, house, namas, the rules that govern the oikos. And so to get at God's household rules, Timothy, you need to promote what God wants the people of God to do and to be. That's his goal. Because he has to go there because the false teachers have misrepresented God's household rules and have taken them off the mission that God wants his people to have. Now, to to know what happens here, and this brings us back to some things we talked about last week, what's happening here in uh, 1 Timothy at the church at Ephesus is the false teachers are misrepresenting where the people of God live in God's timetable of activities. They're misrepresenting the era to which they belong. And as we talked, and you'll see here on the screen, right, the era that preceded the present era in which we live was the Mosaic era, the era under the law. We live here in the ecclesial era, the era from the ascension of Christ to the return of Christ. The era to follow is called the Zionic era. That's when there'll be the millennium and the new heavens and new earth. Right? Well, these false teachers, and you can read here, uh, if you want to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 18, they're teaching that the resurrection has already occurred. They're teaching people that actually they're in an era that is not true. And so they're teaching people that they're not in this era between the coming of Christ and his return, but actually they're in the resurrection. The resurrection has already happened. And so they're, they're, they're uh, putting people in a period of time in which they don't belong, and they're distorting their lives and their mission. And Paul wants to come back and say, no, 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 you're not in that era at all. You're right here. You're in this overlap of the ages where the new covenant blessings have been inaugurated. You've believed on Jesus the King. You've been brought underneath his benevolent rule, but yet you've not been fully conformed to his image. 
So there's an overlap of the ages. Yes, you are a follower of Christ. Yes, you do have the Holy Spirit. Yes, you have been transformed, but you're not there yet. So you're, you're free from the power of sin, but you're not free from its presence. And so you're in a particular era that's before Christ will right all things, before he will transform everything, and you need to know where you are in the biblical storyline or you will get life messed up. So this church, because of thinking that it's in the wrong era of God's redemptive program, has gotten people confused, and Paul says they've shipwrecked people's faith. They've misdirected the church in terms of its purpose and mission and identity. Now, so let's come and let's read our passage here. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to read this with me here, Uh, and then we want to break it down. And Paul, the very first thing after chapter 1 is where he reminds Timothy of the commission Uh, And he prepares Timothy for a difficult task because some people, some leaders have already been disciplined. You'll see that in chapter 1, 18 to 20. So they've already had to to defrock, to set aside some leaders within the church who've been teaching wrongly. So Timothy has to go into a set of house churches. You can see this in chapter 2, verse 8, and different house churches. And he's going there with people who have bought into this false teaching. Uh, who they themselves are happy with their teachers. They're not asking for Timothy to show up, but the apostle is sending Timothy to clean house. So he's coming to a difficult situation, uh, and Paul wants to remind him right off the bat before he gives him instructions about men and women and leaders about the driving priority that should be driving how the women behave in the congregation, how the men behave in the congregation, what kind of leaders they choose, Everything should be driven by this key priority because the purpose of the church should be shaped around God's purpose, his character, and his acts. So let's read this in 1 Timothy chapter 2. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for, the pur- and for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling you the truth. I am not lying. And a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, So let's talk here a little bit as far as what Paul wants to say is the priority of the church. What should it be gathered and focused around when the church gathers together and as the church plans its programs, as the church evaluates itself as to how it's doing, what should be the purpose that is shaping their direction, guiding their evaluation? Now I want you to notice here as we begin this passage, he begins right off with a command. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Okay, so the first command here, I urge that prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all. Okay? Now, I'm going to prepare you here. I'm going to take a view of this that I think the passage definitely calls for, but it's not the way this passage is usually read. Usually, when you come to this passage, people turn to it, and they're only interested in it at kind of civic moments like 4th of July uh, or those kinds of moments where it's a command to pray for kings and those who are in authority. And some people read it as saying, well, we're praying for kings and those who are in authority so that they might leave us alone to live a quiet and peaceful life, right? So uh, maybe in California today, there's a lot of Christians who are praying, right, that Gavin Newsom, their governor, would leave them alone so that they could leave a a quiet and peaceful life. Well, some people have taken that. Like, the point of this is that uh, Paul is encouraging the church to be praying for authorities so that the church might be left alone to do its evangelistic work, right? Well, number one, uh, I don't find any other prayers like this in Paul. As a matter of fact, I find in Paul everywhere that he assumes that everyone, if you read this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, everyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. One of the things that's a given about the Christian life is that we will know strife and difficulty from the outside world because we are, uh, an, we are a, a little outpost of the king who's yet 
to come back and establish his kingdom. We're little outposts of the king in a world that's hostile to him. And so Jesus was the one who told us, right, that if you, if you follow me, you're going to become like me, and if you become like me, you're going to be treated like I was. Well, Jesus said you're going to be hated like I was hated. Right? Just read about it in Matthew chapter 10. So I don't think Paul here is praying at all for leaders so that they might be left alone. I think he's doing something very different here. And so if you look at the screen here, a couple I've written here a little bit in detail because this is so different from the way it's often presented, but this command of Paul's is a figure of speech. If you want to know what the figure of speech is, it's called a pleonasm. It's where you take a bunch of synonyms and you pile them all up together to make a major point. And so what he does here is these synonyms of prayer are piled up here to emphasize that the church should be a group of people marked by a loving submission to God's will and a life lived in dependence upon God. Prayer is the posture of submission and dependence. So it is about prayer. He actually is commanding them to pray, but it's much more than just prayer that he's talking about. He's using prayer to stand for a life fully submitted to God's will and dependent upon him. This is the same kind of thing that Jesus does when he goes to the temple. If you remember this, in the cleansing of the temple, when he gets so aggravated and he sees these these people uh, ripping off people, making money off of the poor and the desperate there at the steps of the temple mount, and they're, they're, they're charging exorbitant prizes, and, and Jesus walks up and says, this is my father's house. It was meant to be a house of prayer, and now you've made it a den of thieves, right? And when he says a house of prayer, if you look at everything that happened in the temple, if you were just looking at prayers just as a description of talking with God, well, there was a lot more than happened at the temple than prayer, when he says a house of prayer, so that there were sacrifices, there was all kinds of things happening at the temple, but prayer stood for this should be a house that is submitted to the Father's will and, and promoting his purposes, dependent upon him. That should be the posture of the people, not people who are trying to use God to fleece other people in his name. And so here, Paul's using that same sort of expression, so he's commending prayer to happen, but it's, it's the posture of prayer that he's really commending. People are submitted to God. And as we go on to verses 3 through 7, Paul makes it clear what he wants to emphasize is that the church should be driven by God's heart for the rescue and reclamation of all types of people. He will make clear throughout the letter of 1 Timothy that this means not only that they proclaim the good news of what Christ has done uh, done for unbelievers, but that they also reflect God's saving purpose in their inner life within their church body. They are to proclaim the gospel and embody its life-changing impact. Right? So the church is to be a witness by virtue of its inner life of what God does when he says saves people, and there to be people who are proclaiming it. That's to be their utter desire. Because why? That's God's heart, and he's going to make it clear. He grounds this whole command in the fact that God's a savior who desires everyone to come and know the truth, right? So prayer here is put for a posture of submission to God, God's will, and complete dependence upon him. Well, that posture should be the heartbeat of the church for God's purposes of salvation to go forward. And so he expands here on this. He elaborates on the purpose in this opening couple verses here. And he first he wants to say here that a couple things, that this should be the priority, that a submission to God and his purposes should be the absolute priority of the church. And so he says it right off the bat. First of all, then, right? The very first thing that when a church comes together, when EBC comes together, uh, we should be making sure that we're on mission with God. And God's heart is that everybody come to know Christ. And that should be our drive. That's one of the key things that we should be evaluating, what we preach about, what we teach in our, our classes, how we're talking to our own children, Right? how we're praying for our neighbors, how we're engaging in our, our, our city and with our, our colleagues at work. So that idea here, it should be first of all the priority, not the first in a set of things to do, but the first priority that shapes everything else that we do. So you see that in the bottom, something that drives the life of the people of God. And then he goes on to say, well, what scope should this be? The scope should be all people. And he emphasized it here, said more for all people, and for kings and all those in authority. And what I think uh, Paul's trying to emphasize here is that these prayers that we're giving, that we're, we're submitted to God, we're following him, we're yearning for his saving purposes to be fulfilled in us and through us. And so we're praying in every possible way for God to enable us to be his people, 
and to represent him in the world. So we're praying in every possible way for that to happen. And then, but who do we have as the object of our, our prayers? And who do we look for a reaching? Well, not some select group, not a particular class of people, not a particular ethnicity, not somebody in a particular socioeconomic, no, all people. Because God desires it all people. And that even includes the people who seem like the most unlikely to be reached or the ones that would be out of the reach of the church, the people who are, seem to be ruling and reigning in the world in which we live. So it's comprehensive because the kings and authority are a subset of all people. But he wants to emphasize that this saving work that God's interested in extends to them. So these are prayers not just that rulers would rule wisely. These are prayers that rulers would bow their knee to the king of the universe and that we would represent his authority and his rule of, in mercy and grace and compassion for everyone. So the scope is salvation for all, and then the effect, and this is where I want to draw you to the passage here. Look in chapter 2, chapter two verse 2, that, in order that, we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Okay? Now, I want you to understand this. This is not a purpose that he's looking to affect the kings and the authority people. Right? The structure of the passage is not saying, now we pray for kings, especially so that they might leave us alone. No, this purpose clause is that the church itself might be affected by this purpose so that we become these kinds of people. And the idea of peaceful and quiet is not somebody who's just kind of minding their own business in the corner. Quiet is a term that's used to describe social spaces. And quiet is the idea that uh, if uh, I'm in the classroom and I have students and myself as the teacher, we occupy different social spaces. The students are the, occupy the social space of a student. I occupy the social space of a teacher. I, when I come into that room and quiet with respect to the social space of a teacher, a social space of a student, and they're quiet with respect to the social space of a teacher, right? So when I get in to teach, I don't have, I stand up here and all of a sudden 30 students walk up beside me and put their podiums right next to me and start teaching. No, we've got different social spaces we occupy. And so what he's talking about to the church to live quiet and peaceful is that they fit into the social space that God designed the church to occupy. And the social space for the church is to be the redemptive agents in the world. They're the people that are on mission with God, proclaiming what Christ has done, what he is doing, and what he will do, the gospel. They're the people, and if they don't take up that social space in society, there's no other group to take it up. So to live quiet and peaceful is for the church to get in its space and stay in its space. Right? So if I'm in the classroom and somebody steps out of their space and tries to be the teacher, I say, excuse me, you're not the teacher, get back in your space as a student. Now, I don't say it that way, but they need to be quiet with respect to a teacher, and I need to be quiet with respect to the student. If I walk into the room and I just sit at the back of the room and nobody gets up in front to teach and I'm sitting there and the students are looking around going, well, who's going to teach this class? And I said, well, I'm just going to be a student today. Well, the classroom fails because there's no teacher and there's no classroom. So here, the church, to live quiet and peaceful because it goes on in all godliness and holiness, right? Godliness is a life shaped by God's priorities. And it's a holiness is a, a person that's fully separated to God and his purposes, right? So this is a prayer that when we make God's purpose our purpose, it shapes us into the people of God that we're supposed to be in our moment in time. When we keep his purposes as our purpose, it keeps us in our lane, right? And I want to say here to prepare us for the conclusion, we don't step out in the social justice lane as our main priority. We don't step out in the entertainment lane as our main priority. Our main priority is to represent the gospel, to proclaim it and to represent it by our inner life and how we relate to one another as believers, how we are as men and women in relationship to each other, how we behave as the people of God. So, uh, he elaborates on that pur purpose as a top priority. Then, what I want you to notice here, he grounds the purpose, meaning he gives it its theological warrant, its theological support in verses 3 through 7, and he does it in a heavy way. Uh, he, he wants to make us understand that God's desire that people come to know him through a belief in Jesus Christ is right at the heart of God's character and right at the heart of his acts in history. Right? Everything that God is and everything that God has done says this is at the heart of God. So don't miss it. 
So God's heart, he wants to see, and again, this, you can see this all throughout Jesus' life, right? Remember Jesus' words and uh, two of the key statements that get after his mission. Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and some of you remember, and to give his life, what? A ransom for many, right? Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost, okay? Then he passed on that commission to his church and said, now when I'm gone, right, I'm going to give you the Spirit and his gifts, and now take what I've taught you, and I want you to go throughout all the world and make disciples, right? So Paul is just reiterating in different terms what Jesus has said, but he wants to take us theologically there, and he does it in three separate ways. If you'll see here, verses 3 and 4. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth for there's one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. The first thing in verses 3 and 4, God's character as the one God, he desires all people to be saved and he's the only Savior, right? Because the one God, meaning the unique only God, and because he is the one God who is the God of all people, right? He's the God that truly is the only one who stands over and can save and deliver anyone. So his character in verses 3 and 4, this is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God. So we know that God wants them because there's the one God, and this one God is the Savior of all people. And then God God demonstrated that character. He asserted his character that he desires all people to come into a relationship with him, right? Well, how do we know that that's really God's character? How is that demonstrated by his acts in history? Well, Paul immediately then goes, well, to Christ. You just need to look at Jesus if you want to see what God's heart is. For there's one God and one mediator between God and mankind the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all people, this has now been witnessed to at the proper time. Now notice three things here. The deity of Christ demonstrates his death reveals God's saving character. The one God, the unique one God, is also true of Jesus. He's the one God. Right? So we talked about Trinity, right? Three persons, one God, right? So he's one God, so we know Jesus represents the heart of God because he himself is God, Right? And then secondly, the nature of Christ's death for all men, right? He died for who? For everybody. Well, we know then that God's desires for all types of people to come saved. Why? Because Christ died for all people, right? Who gave himself as a ransom for all people. And then the timing of, of Christ's death demonstrates that the truth of God's assertion that he desires all people to be saved because it occurred at the proper time is the term that Paul uses. Another way to render that is to say at God's own right time, at the exact time that God appointed. So we know that Jesus' death demonstrates the character of the God who desires all people to be saved. Why? Because he is God, because his death was for all people, and because it occurred right according to God's plan. So we know that that's God's heart. Okay? And that little phrase there, it says, who gave himself a ransom of all, Paul is just drawing on what Jesus said about his own mission in Mark 10, 45, the one I just quoted a little bit ago. I did not come to be served, but to, ser- but to serve and give my life a ransom for all. Okay? So write to Jesus' own mission statement. And then thirdly, he wants to point to his own call as a demonstration that God desires all people to be saved. All right? Look at verse 7. And for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle, and notice this, this phrase that comes in here, this oath that Paul takes, right? This, he swears, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, and it's stuck right in the middle of that sentence, and the reason why it's stuck right there, because he wants to emphasize what he's going to say right here at the end of the verse, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. So Paul's call, that he was certainly called by God, demonstrates God's desire for all people to be saved because he called Paul the Jew to go to who? The rest of the nations. Right? So Paul's own life and calling demonstrate the heart of God that all people, all types of people, come to know him. So Paul just takes a, a, just a huge resounding thud as he drops this, this theological bomb right here at the bottom and says, this is God's heart. God's heart is all desires all people to 
All types of people come to know him through a relationship with Jesus Christ. The very ministry of Christ screams it. My own call screams it. And so this should be the heartbeat of the church. So we should gather together as the people of God. And everything that we do should be submitted to that purpose. That should be our first priority. And we want to take up our place in this moment, in this time, in our generation, to carry forward the proclamation of what God has done in Christ, what he is doing, what he will do, and call people to believe in him. And we want to organize our lives around what he's doing to recreate us as his people, as men and women, as husbands and wives, and as the people of God. So this is Paul's purpose for us to be his redemptive agents in this time by bringing people into a relationship with him to, through, through demonstrating his gospel work in us as a group of people, in our families, in our church family, and by proclaiming that this is the time to believe in Christ. Now, so the purpose then, just to come here as we wrap up our time, is to put it this way, is that God's heart to bring all types of people into a growing relationship with Christ must be the priority of God's family. Okay. We could say this as Jesus said it, it should be our desire in Matthew chapter 28, it should be our desire to go and make disciples, teaching them everything that Christ has taught us, right? So we're not only bringing people into a relationship with Christ through proclaiming the gospel, the need for every person to acknowledge they're a rebel, to repent of their sin, to call out to Jesus and say, Jesus, do for me what I can't do for myself. But it's not, it doesn't end there. It's for them to grow into their new identity as they wait for the king to return. And to do that not just by themselves, but in relationship with the people of God. And there's something about our witness to Christ that can't happen just as individual Christians. We need to gather together as the people of God. And we're going to talk about that in the weeks ahead because there's a dimension of what God wants to demonstrate to the world that can only happen in a gathered group of people. That the only thing they have in common is the fact they've all believed in Jesus. They don't have their ethnicity in common, their class in common, their socioeconomic status in common. All they have is that they were rebels and they've been rescued by Christ and they've been brought together now in harmony and oneness to serve him in all their diversity and difference. So God's heart to bring all types of people into a growing relationship with Christ must be the priority of God's family. So let me just say a couple things here to remind us. We are to reflect God's saving purposes and who we are and what we are as his people. God's heart for the world to know his life in Christ by the Spirit must be the heart of God's people. We can't miss God's heart if we pay attention to his nature and his acts. He said, I desire all types of people to come into a saving relationship with me. And the ministry of Jesus Christ demonstrates it clearly. The call of the Apostle Paul demonstrates it clearly. You can't miss it. So church, stay focused. Stay in your lane. Okay? We're not a social movement. We're not um, uh, as good as all the work that Samaritan Purse does. We're not Samaritan's Purse. Samaritan's Purse does a unique mission that is a narrow slice of what the church is and does. We're not a parachurch organization that focuses on a, a given group of people and says we're all about this subgroup of people. No, the church is a place that's open to everyone that God calls to himself. And Paul's going to go in Ephesians chapter 4 and says, I, I brought this unity together, now it's your job to make it work. You don't get to choose just a select little group within it. You are to be the people of God. So we're to foster our identity and protect our mission as men and women and leaders in the church. Right? And as we're going to emphasize later on, it means, too, that the mission of the church right now is not a mission of nation-making. In the millennium, when the, the king returns and establishes his kingdom, then everything will be redeemed from the structures of society right down to the individuals that are ruled. But in this moment, the witness of the church conducts its witness from the upside-down power of, of living shaped by a cross. We're people who bear the cross. We're the off-scouring of the world. We're the scum of the earth. We're the people who identify with the crucified Messiah. We take his identity marker, the cross, and we carry it with us, representing him, because the crucified king, king came in, and, and came in humility and offered a way into the kingdom 
a way out from his judgment. Now is the time to declare, is the time to come underneath his benevolent rule because when the king returns, there will just be judgment. And when he returns, he will right all things. So for us at EBC, how are we doing? Is that our mission? Is that how you're evaluating the church when you come in? Is that what you're desiring to have happen? God, help us to be his people and be Uh, have the same purpose and desire that he has in seeing people come to Christ and grow in Christ. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercies to us today. Lord, we are so grateful that you reached us, Lord. You saved us. Lord, you rescued us. Uh, Lord, we were rebels and we were running in the other direction. Uh, Lord, we were lost and we couldn't see. And Lord, we, we needed help. And somebody came and told us about you. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a friend. Uh, Maybe it was uh, a pastor. Maybe uh, it was a Sunday school teacher. Lord, maybe it was uh, uh, a grandmother or a grandfather. Maybe it was an aunt or uncle. Lord, somebody, Lord, stayed on mission. And in their prayers and in their conversations, Lord, they were burdened for us. And Lord, they told us about what you had done, what Christ had done for us. And Lord, that's what drove them. That's why they taught their Sunday school. That's why they got on their knees for their grandkids. That's why they, they invited their neighbors to come to church. That's why they put their neighbors on their prayer list. That's why they were crying out for their sons and daughters to come to know Christ. Lord, forgive us in every way that we've lost a sense of our identity. We've stepped out of our lane and become something. Lord, we, as the people of God, we will step into injustices. You call us to love. And to step into those because you call us to to step into the brokenness of our world. But the church is not going to right the world. The church is going to proclaim the need for the world to be righted with Christ. And when you come, you'll right the world. So Lord, may all of our compassion, may all of our engagement in culture serve your mission and not become our mission. We pray this in the name of Christ.